A Gospel reading from the 18th chapter of Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Jesus said to the disciples, If another member of a church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And even if the offender refuses to listen, even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if you two agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, grace and peace to you, my friends in Christ. Jesus knows. Jesus knows that there will be conflict. Jesus knows that the disciples will face different challenges as they build their church. And so, he teaches them solutions to resolve disagreements and to restore relationships with one another. It's brilliant. Yet through our brokenness, we still often get it wrong. To be human is to embrace our differences in how we operate. And that could be in work, in families, how our kids are being coached in their sports, in how we make decisions as a community. In the heat of the moment, oftentimes when we hear Matthew 18, we think about how this process would play out. We respond to the person who has wronged us, and when we think about how we feel when we've been wronged, it's often very emotionally charged. We might not see the full picture at the time. We might have a need for our own righteousness, our own affirmation that we are right to be what is most important, and that challenges our vision. We miss the rightness that is more important our rightness with others and with God. This summer I spent with chaplains from across the country with different faith traditions and beliefs and backgrounds as I was learning about becoming an army chaplain. I expected more theological fights and disagreements than what really occurred. And yes, they did occur, but the majority of my conversations this summer were with peers who were seeking Resolution and reconciliation. How do we move forward? I also had the opportunity to do something I haven't done in a long time. I had the opportunity to join something. I joined the choir. (laughs) Yeah. Don't clap yet. I haven't started singing. Um, I. But there was there was a, a call out to say, does anybody want to join and sing the national anthem at our big uh, formal ball? And of course, one of my friends did it, and I was like, oh, if you're going to do it, well, maybe I should tag along. And so as I tagged along and realized what I'd gotten myself into, we had realized that the director, who was a music director in her home congregation, had decided she was going to take the national anthem and she was going to put her own little flavor to it. She had come up with her own arrangement, and it was just beautiful. But it was unique and challenging, and it was a tune that uh, we're familiar with, but the way she had uh, modified it was something that was challenging. We, We had some hard times with it. And so as we're trying to learn this piece, it was not hitting home. We had a lot of male voices and not a lot of people singing the melody. In fact, the choir director was our only person singing the melody. And so... Two weeks before our big performance, our music director uh, had some news that she was going to have to leave. She was going to have to go home. And don't worry, she'll be able to come back. But as we kind of stared at each other, the other eight of us looked at each other like, well, now what are we going to do? We, we barely know how to sing this piece as it is, and the one who's like been the glue to keep us all together is now leaving. 
And so the conflict wasn't necessarily another person harming us, but the conflict was how do we come up with a resolution? How do we come up with a solution that's going to honor what we've been trying to do, but also be able to, to give voice and honor uh, what we've been called into? And so as a group, we had one of those come to Jesus talks. The, hey, we need to do something. We need to figure this out quick. And everyone had an opinion, but our path really did seem like the most successful way that we were going to do this was to sing a version that we were a little bit more familiar with and also to move some of those guy voices to the melody. Guys, you know, it's been hard to get you to, to learn this part, so let's sing the part you know and sing it and sing it, sing it out. And while we were sad to have our friend leave, we almost immediately realized that we had made the right decision. Thanks to the help of uh, Linda Burke, actually. I, I texted Linda during one of my breaks because, God forbid, you were not allowed to have your phone out ever. Uh, so I had to go out and find a random place where I had a reception, and I texted Linda. I'm like, Linda, I need your help. Can you send me the audio parts to the national anthem so that we can all practice this, and we need to have it done, like, tomorrow? Like, <laughs> and she did. So it was beautiful. Like, we all had the parts. We all knew how to sing our own part. And we all were able to come together quickly and make that switch. We were willing to pivot, even though it was risky, because we trusted each other to make that collective decision. That's what Matthew 18 is really trying to get us to think about, is how do you move forward when there's conflict or something that's a challenge and make a decision together? I was blessed to be in that situation, to be able to come together and to sing. But I think about how so often when those conflicts do arise, we we might not necessarily know how to embrace it, or we want to skip a step, or we want to avoid the person that we have the conflict with and just say, well, I'm going to solve this, and and then you're just going to find out after the fact. It's about blaming instead of finding a solution. But instead, by following this trusted biblical process to work together, Think of what we can do. Today we have the steels with us in worship, and as I've been thinking about their arrival, I couldn't help but think of the ways that music can be one of those tools of reconciliation. And so since that is how uh, so much of us being able to come together in worship is, is played out, I wanted to ask JD to come down here because I think it'd be helpful to ask some questions and say, JD, music has been an instrumental part of your life. How, is it, how has it been a tool for reconciliation? But before we get to that even, you, you started to address how, how much your father was an influence on you musically. Can you tell us a little bit more, like, what, what, was, uh, what was music like growing up, and why was it such an important value within your family? Well, we grew up in, uh, I grew up in a city called Gary, Indiana. <laughs> and uh, Gary, Indiana, in the 60s, was the quintessential African-American community in the United States. We elected the first black mayor in the country in 1968, Mayor Richard Hatcher. And it was a very vibrant city during those days. When the steel mills shut down in the early 70s, started shutting down, the city's unemployment rate went to 52%. And by then, I was in college at Purdue University. My brother Fred and I were both there. There was nothing ever for us to come back to, but the music was so important in our lives. Uh, My family grew up down the street from the Jackson 5, and people would confuse us with the Jackson 5, and we'd go, no, we're the church singing group. (laughs) (laughs) So it had had a great influence on us. I I remember my my fourth grade teacher, who's going to be coming to hear us in concert this month at uh, McPhail. Um, He was a great influence on my life. Uh, Mr. McLeod, my eighth grade music teacher, Mr. Jackson, was a great influence on me because he was a classically trained singer. He would make me sing over and over. Ave Maria Gra... I hated that song. <laughs> he made me sing it so much. But, but the fact that he taught me an appreciation for classical and opera music had a great impact on me. When we did our first performance at Carnegie Hall, back when we were on Broadway in 1988, I remember walking into Carnegie Hall and saying, wow, look at this fabulous building. It's so fantastic. And it was empty, and we were getting ready for a sound check. And I walked to the middle of the stage, and the first thing I did was, 
Ave Maria. Mr. Jackson had passed away a year before we opened on Broadway, and I never got to tell him thank you wow. for having such an impact on my life. Incredible faith mentors, incredible music leaders. How, how was church an integral part of you being able to say, wow, this is something I'm passionate about. I want to keep doing that. Was it, was it the music first or the church first? Well, uh, I, I would say it was the church first okay. uh, and then the music. But they were almost such so integrally connected. Uh, the church and the music were always connected. I started singing when I was six and Fred was four at the time we started, and then uh, some other kids were born and came along with us and singing. So um, when I went to college, I got confused. Uh, my faith got confused because I had grown up in a Pentecostal church, and then I started studying Hebrewism and Hindu and Buddhist and Muslim faith, and I started studying all these other faiths while I was in college, and I got confused. So when people would ask me what I believed in, I would give such a sophisticated answer that I didn't even know what I said. Yeah. I had lost my direction, and I came back to it post-college, mm. and, uh, and it really helped me regain my footing when I came back to the gospel. Yeah, we, you, you could see how many kids we've got here that a lot of them are, are also encouraged to help, uh, help learn and, and to start singing. What, what advice would you give to us in encouraging our youth to really have music as a foundation? Well, I, I would say, you know, to sing with your children uh, as well as singing to your children. Uh, it will help them become really comfortable with musicality. Um, people who don't, I rarely meet a person that doesn't like any music. <laughs> And when I do, I think that maybe they need to check their souls because I don't know how you can live without music because music is such an integral part of our, of our society. You hear it on elevators. You hear it in Target. You hear it everywhere you go. So um, I, I would say to encourage by singing to and with your children. We haven't had the two of you back here since pre-COVID. So that's been a significant event that's happened in our world. How, how, had, how did COVID affect uh, just what you've perceived music-wise? Was that, uh, what were some of the challenges of, of music during the last few years? Do you see uh, just different changes in kind of how we as a society have embraced music through this? Was, was that something you saw? Well, COVID was a difficult time for all of us to navigate, and uh, particularly when it came to music and choirs, because I, I work with about 200 singers a week. Um, with my community choirs and with my youth choir. And uh, at one time during COVID, they were discouraging anybody from getting together and singing. So what I started doing was started teaching online. So we would have Zoom sessions with about 50 or 60 singers. And it was really hard not to be together. And so you couldn't sing at the same time because during Zoom, you can't sing at the same time. So I would do one by one by one, by one. And I became more Stephen Colbert, the entertainer, <laughs> than J.D. Steele, the choir director, because I started entertaining them. Fred and I both did, and we had such a great time. Sometimes I'd bring on guest directors uh, to, to speak with them in a session, and uh, it, it was a very, very challenging time. Yeah. And it kept us from traveling. Yeah. Now that now that some of that has changed, what are some of the things you've maybe appreciated the most? Um, you said traveling, certainly. Have you been able to do a lot more traveling again? Yeah, but we've begun traveling again in 2021, and uh, in 2022 started getting back on out on the road. Um, it, it was tough. Just one thing I noticed that people when they got back together. Everybody just loved on each other. Like, oh my God, it's so great to see people again. Didn't you yeah. feel like that? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. so great to come into the sanctuary of God and to worship together again. It was just a great feeling. And it did bring us closer together than we were before COVID. Yeah. It re really did bring us closer together. I like to remind uh, my choir members and my friends and on my platforms that we have way more in common then we have differences. Unfortunately, 
Some of us get so caught up in that 24 seven news media cycle, it makes us think the world is just coming to an end. When in reality, we're loving more than ever before. I work with young people who are going to change the world. Those kids that were sitting here are going to change the world because they get it and they're going to understand it and we're going to feel it. So COVID really had an impact on all this. You really touched on the fact that COVID also brought a lot of um, challenges. Matthew 18 is that passage that when I think of how, how do we... Uh, resolve a conflict, this is one of the ways to do that, is you, you take somebody aside, you bring them together, you try to come up to a solution, find some reconciliation. How has music been a tool of reconciliation through your life? Well, it's been quite a tool of reconciliation for me. Um, I spent uh, about nine years in a row going back and forth to Nairobi, Kenya, to work with these kids in the slum. And these kids were fantastic, I have 362 kids, uh, that I work with over in uh, one of the largest slums on the continent. And these kids, when I first went over, I, I was teaching them a lot of gospel music, a lot of uh, soul music, and we were having such great fun. And then I started touring with them. We went to Greece, and then we went to Tanzania, uh, to Zanzibar, an island just off the coast of Tanzania in the Indian Ocean. And when I got there to do this workshop with 400 kids, somebody forgot to tell me that 93% of Zanzibar was Muslim. So I had these Muslim children on one side of the room and I had Christian children on one side of the room and they were not communicating. They were just looking at each other. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna teach? So I started making up songs about light and love and happiness and joy. And after three days, these kids were all singing and dancing together all over the place. Oh, that's beautiful. It taught me. Thank you. It, it really had an impact on me. It taught me that if we create music that shares our commonalities, shares the things that we all treasure and value, family, friendship, love, our children, it will make such a difference in the world because sometimes religion can be a very divisive thing on this planet. But if we share and respect each other's differences, it makes all the difference in the world, Pastor. That's a beautiful uh, way to just connect all this together. I'd love for us to get back to some of the music. We, what a gift it's been for the two of you to be here. Any parting words of wisdom at this point, or can we uh, turn it back over to the two of you? Well, love each other, you guys. Yeah. Love, love each other. Love the people that you come into contact with, even when they look different than you. You know, when I was in, when I go to Africa, they always look at me and think I'm from Morocco ah. because I'm light skinned with curly hair. Uh -huh. And that's how the Moroccans look. Please lift your prayers up for the people of Morocco in Northern uh, Africa. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.